This is the third Dhamma talk from this collection. And this is called Convention and Liberation. And this um, was first published in the book called A Taste of Freedom. And it's from an informal talk given in the Northeastern dialect from an unidentified tape. The things of this world are merely conventions of our own making. Having established them, we get lost in them and refuse to let go, giving rise to clinging to personal views and opinions. This clinging never ends. It is samsara, flowing endlessly on. It has no completion. Now, if we know conventional reality, then we'll know liberation. If we clearly know liberation, then we'll know convention. This is to know the Dhamma. Here, there is completion. Take people, for instance. In reality, people don't have any names. We're born naked into the world. <coughs> Our names arise only through convention. I've contemplated this and seen that if you don't know the truth of this convention, it can be really harmful. It's simply something we use for convenience. Without it, we couldn't communicate. There will be nothing to say, no language. I've seen Westerners when they sit in meditation together in the West. When they get up after sitting, men and women together, sometimes they go and touch each other on the head. When I saw this I thought, hey, if we cling to convention it gives rise to defilements right there. If we can let go of convention, give up our opinions, we're at peace. And uh, as a footnote it says, um, touch a person's head in Thailand is usually considered an insult. Mm -hmm. So this was a very strange and mysterious thing for people to be doing in a random way uh, after sitting together meditating. If we can let go of convention, give up our opinions, we are at peace. Like the generals and colonels, men of rank and position, who come to see me. When they come they say, oh, please touch my head. This is being uh, considered an auspicious thing in Thailand to have your head touched by a highly esteemed monk. If they ask like this, there's nothing wrong with it. They're glad to have their heads touched. But if you tap their heads in the middle of the street, it'll be a different story. This is because of clinging. So I feel that letting go is really the way to peace. Touching a head is against our customs, but in reality, it's nothing. When they agree to having it touched, there's nothing wrong with it, just like touching a cabbage or a potato. Accepting, giving up, letting go, this is the way of lightness. Wherever you're clinging, there's becoming and birth right there. There's danger right there. The Buddha taught about convention and he taught to undo convention in the right way and so reach liberation. This is freedom not to cling to conventions. All the things in this world have a conventional reality. Having established them, we should not be fooled by them, because getting lost in them really leads to suffering. This point concerning rules and conventions is of utmost importance. One who can get beyond them is beyond suffering. However, they are a characteristic of our world. Take Mr. Boonmar, for instance. He used to be just one of the crowd, but now he's been appointed the district commissioner. It's just a convention, but it's a convention we should respect. It's part of the world of people. If you think, oh, before we were friends, we used to work at the tailors together, and then you go and pat him on the head in public, he'll get angry. It's not right. He'll resent it. So we should follow the conventions in order to avoid giving rise to resentment. It's useful to understand convention. Living in the world is just about this. Know the right time and place. Know the person. Why is it wrong to, to go against conventions? It's wrong because of people. You should be clever, knowing both convention and liberation. Know the right time for each. If we know how to use rules and conventions comfortably, then we are skilled. But if we try to behave according to the higher level of reality in the wrong situation, this is wrong. Where is it wrong? It's wrong with people's defilements. 
That's where. People all have defilements. In one situation we behave one way, in another situation we must behave in another way. We should know the ins and outs because we live within conventions. Problems occur because people cling to them. If we suppose something to be, then it is. It's there because we suppose it to be there. But if you look closely, in the absolute sense, these things don't really exist. As I have often said, before we were laymen, now we are monks. We live within the convention of laymen, now we live within the convention of monk. We are monks by convention, not monks through liberation. In the beginning we established conventions like this, but if a person merely ordains, this doesn't mean he overcomes his defilements. If we take a handful of sand and agree to call it salt, does this make it salt? It's salt, but only in name, not in reality. You couldn't use it to cook with. Its only use is within the realm of that agreement, because there's really no salt there, only sand. It becomes salt only through our supposing it to be so. This word, liberation, is itself just a convention, but it refers to that which is beyond conventions. Having achieved freedom, having reached liberation, we still have to use convention in order to refer to it as liberation. If we didn't have convention, we couldn't communicate, so it does have its use. For example, people have different names, but they're all people just the same. If we didn't have names to differentiate between each other, and we wanted to call out to somebody standing in a crowd saying, Hey, person, person, that would be useless. You couldn't say who would answer you, because they're all person. But if you called, Hey, John, then John would respond and the others wouldn't. Names fulfill just this need. Through them we can communicate. They provide the basis for social behaviour. So you should know both convention and liberation. Conventions have a use, but in reality there really isn't anything there. Even people are non-existent. They are merely groups of elements, born of causal conditions, growing dependent on conditions, existing for a while, then disappearing in the natural way. No one can oppose or control it. But without conventions, we would have nothing to say. We'd have no names, no practice, no work. Rules and conventions are established to give us a language, to make things convenient, and that's all. Take money, for example. In olden times, there weren't any coins or notes. They had no value. People used to barter goods. Those things were difficult to keep. So they created money, using coins and notes. Perhaps in the future we'll have a new king decree that we don't have to use paper money. We should use wax, melting it down and pressing it into lumps. We'll say, this is money, and use it throughout the country. Let alone wax, they might even decide to make chicken dung the local currency. All the other things can't be money, just chicken dung. Then people would fight and kill each other over chicken dung. <laughs> This is the way it is. You could use many examples to illustrate convention. What we use for money is simply a convention that we have set up. That we have set up. It has its use within that convention. Having decreed it to be money, it becomes money. But in reality, what is money? Nobody can say. When there's a popular agreement about something, then a convention comes about to fulfill the need. The world is just this. This is convention, but to get ordinary people to understand liberation is really difficult. Our money, our house, our family, our children, our relatives are all simply conventions that we've invented, but really, seen in the light of Dhamma, they don't belong to us. Maybe if we hear this we don't feel so good, but reality is like that. These things have value only through the established conventions. If we establish that it doesn't have value, then it doesn't have value. If we establish that it has value, then it has value. This is the way it is. We bring convention into the world to fulfill a need. Even this body is not really ours. We just suppose it to be so. 
It's truly just an assumption on, on our part. If you try to find a real, substantial self within it, you can't. There are merely elements which are born, continue for a while, and then die. Everything is like this. There's no tree, uh, real, true substance to it. But it's proper that we use it. It's like a cup. At some time that cup must break. But while it's there, you should use it and look after it well. It's a tool for your use. If it breaks, there's trouble. So even though it must break, you should try your utmost to preserve it. And so we have the four supports. These are robes, arms, food, lodgings and medicines, to which the Buddha taught again and again to contemplate. They are the supports on which a monk depends to continue his practice. As long as you live, you must depend on them, but you should understand them. Don't cling to them, giving rise to craving in your mind. Convention and liberation are continually related like this. Even though we use convention, don't place your trust in it as being the truth. If you cling to it, suffering will arise. The case of right and wrong is a good example. Some people see wrong as being right and right as being wrong. But in the end, who really knows what is right and what is wrong? We don't know. Different people establish different conventions about what's right and what's wrong, but the Buddha took suffering as his guideline. If you want to argue about it, there's no end to it. One says right, another says wrong. One says wrong, another says right. In truth, we don't really know right and wrong at all. But at a useful, practical level, we can say that right is not to harm oneself and not to harm others. This way fulfills a constructive purpose for us. After all, rules, conventions and liberation are simply dhammas. One is higher than the other, but they go hand in hand. There's no way that we can guarantee that anything is definitely like this or like that. So the Buddha said to just leave it be. Leave it be as uncertain. However much you like it or dislike it, you should understand it is uncertain. Regardless of time and place, the whole practice of Dhamma comes to completion at the place where there is nothing. It's the place of surrender, of emptiness, of laying down the burden. This is the finish. It's not like the person who says, Why is the flag fluttering in the wind? I say it's because of the wind. Another person says, it's because of the flag. The other retorts that it's because of the wind. There's no end to this. The same as the old riddle, which came first, the chicken or the egg? There's no way to reach a conclusion. This is just nature. All these things we say are merely conventions. We establish them ourselves. If you know these things with wisdom, then you'll know impermanence, suffering and not self. This is the outlook which leads to enlightenment. Training and teaching people with varying levels of understanding is really difficult. Some people have certain ideas. You tell them something and they don't believe you. You tell them the truth and they say, it's not true. I'm right, you're wrong. There's no end to this. If you don't let go, there will be suffering. I told you before about the four men who go into the forest. They hear a chicken crowing, Kakate! One of them wonders, Is that a rooster or a hen? Three of them say together, It's a hen. But the other doesn't agree. He insists it's a rooster. How could a hen crow like that? He asks. They retort, Well, it has a mouth, hasn't it? They argue and argue till the tears fall, really getting upset over it. But in the end, they're all wrong. Whether you say a hen or a rooster, they're only names. We establish these conventions saying a rooster is like this, a hen is like that, a rooster cries like this, a hen cries like that, and this is how we get stuck in the world. Remember this. Actually, if you just say that really there's no hen and no rooster, then that's the end of it. In the field of conventional reality, one side is right and the other side is wrong, but there will never be a complete agreement. Arguing till, the tears, arguing till the tears fall has no use. The Buddha taught not to cling. How do we practice non-clinging? We practice simply by giving up clinging. But this non-clinging is very difficult to understand. 
It takes keen wisdom to investigate and penetrate this, to really achieve non-clinging. When you think about it, whether people are happy or sad, content or discontent, doesn't depend on their having little or having much. It depends on wisdom. All distress can be transcended only through wisdom, through seeing the truth of things. So the Buddha exhorted us to investigate, to contemplate. This contemplation means simply to try to solve these problems correctly. This is our practice. Like birth, old age, sickness and death, they are the most natural and common of occurrences. The Buddha taught to contemplate birth, old age, sickness and death, but some people don't understand this. What's there to contemplate, they say. They're born, but they don't know birth. They will die, but they don't know death. A person who investigates these things repeatedly will see. Having seen, he will gradually solve his problems. Even if he still has clinging, if he has wisdom and sees that old age, sickness and death are the way of nature, he'll be able to relieve suffering. We study the Dhamma simply for this, to cure suffering. There isn't really much as the basis of Buddhism. There's just the birth and death of suffering. And this the Buddha called the truth. Birth is suffering, old age is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering. People don't see this suffering as the truth. If we know truth, then we know suffering. This pride in personal opinions, these arguments, they have no end. In order to put our minds at rest, to find peace, we should contemplate our past, the present, and the things which are in store for us, like birth, old age, sickness and death. What can we do to avoid being plagued by these things? Even though we may still have a little worry, if we investigate until we know according to the truth, all suffering will abate, because we will no longer cling to things. Anyway, this is the fourth talk of this collection, entitled No Abiding. And this was first published in A Taste of Freedom, and it was a talk given to the monks, novices and lay people of Wat Ba Nanachat, on a visit to Wat Ba Pong, <coughs> during the Rains Retreat of 1980. We hear some of the teachings and can't really understand them. We think they shouldn't be the way they are, so we don't follow them. But really, there's a reason to all the teachings. Maybe it seems that things shouldn't be that way, but they are. At first I didn't even believe in sitting meditation. I couldn't see what was the use, what use it would be just to sit with your eyes closed. And walking meditation? Walking from this tree to that tree? Turning around and walking back again? Why bother, I thought. What's the use of all that walking? I thought like that, but actually, walking and sitting meditation are of great use. Some people's tendencies cause them to prefer walking meditation. Others prefer sitting, but you can't do without either of them. The scriptures refer to the four postures, standing, walking, sitting and lying down. We live with these four postures. We may prefer one to the other, but we must use all four. The scriptures say to make these four postures even. To make the practice even in all postures, at first I couldn't figure out what it meant to make them even. Maybe it means we sleep for two hours, then stand for two hours, then walk for two hours. Maybe that's it. I tried it. Couldn't do it. It was impossible. That's not what it meant to make the postures even. Making the postures even refers to the mind, to our awareness, giving rise to wisdom in the mind, to illumine the mind. This wisdom of ours must be present in all postures. We must know or understand constantly. Standing, walking, sitting or lying down, we know all mental states as impermanent, unsatisfactory and not self. Making the postures even in this way can be done. It is possible. Whether like or dislike are present in the mind, we don't forget our practice. We are aware. If we just focus our attention on the mind constantly, then we have the gist of the practice. Whether we experience mental states which the world knows as good or bad, we don't forget ourselves. We don't get lost in good or bad, we just go straight. Making the postures constant in this way is possible. 
If we have constancy in our practice, when we're praised, then it's simply praise. If we're blamed, it's just blame. We don't get high or low over it. We stay right here. Why? Because we see the danger in all those things. We see their results. We are constantly aware of the danger in both praise and blame. Normally, if we have a good mood, the mind is good also. We see them as the same thing. If we have a bad mood, the mind goes bad as well. We don't like it. This is the way it is. This is uneven practice. If we have constancy just to the extent of knowing our moods and knowing we're clinging to them, this is better already. That is, we have awareness. We know what's going on, but we still can't let go. We see ourselves clinging to good and bad, and we know it. We cling to good, and we know it's not right practice, but still we can't let go. This is 50 to 70% of the practice already. There still isn't release, but we know that if we could let go, that would be the way to peace. We keep seeing the equally harmful consequences of all our likes and dislikes, of praise and blame continuously. Whatever the conditions may be, the mind is constant in this way. But if worldly people get blamed or criticized, they get really upset. If they get praised, it cheers them up. They say it's good and get really happy over it. If we know the truth of our various moods, if we know the consequences of clinging to praise and blame, the danger of clinging to anything at all, we will become sensitive to our moods. We will know that clinging to them really causes suffering. We see the suffering, and we see our very clinging as the cause of that suffering. We begin to see the consequences of grabbing and clinging to good and bad because we've grasped them and seen the result before. No real happiness. So now we look for the way to let go. Where is this way to let go? In Buddhism we say, don't cling to anything. We never stop hearing about this, don't cling to anything. This means to hold, but not to cling. Like this flashlight. We think, what is this? So we pick it up. Oh, it's a flashlight. Then we put it down again. We hold things in this way. If we didn't hold anything at all, what could we do? We couldn't do walking meditation or do anything. So we must hold things first. It's wanting, yes, that's true, but later on it leads to barami, virtue or perfection. Like wanting to come here, for instance. Venerable Jagaro came to Wat Papong. He had to want to come here first. If he hadn't felt that he wanted to come, he wouldn't have come. For anybody it's the same. They come here because of wanting. But when wanting arises, don't cling to it. So you come and then you go back. What is this? We pick it up, look at it and see. Oh, it's a flashlight. Then we put it down. This is called holding, but not clinging. We let go. We know, and then we let go. To put it simply, we say just this. No, then let go. Keep looking and letting go. This, they say, is good. This, they say, is not good. No, and then let go. Good and bad, we know it all but we let it go. We don't foolishly cling to things, but we hold them with wisdom. Practicing in this posture can be constant. You must be constant like this. Make the mind know in this way. Let wisdom arise. When the mind has wisdom, what else is there to look for? We should reflect on what we're doing here. For what reason we are living here? What are we working for? In the world, they work for this or that reward. But the monks teach something a little deeper than that. Whatever we do, we ask for no return. We work for no reward. Worldly people work because they want this or that, because they want some gain or other. But the Buddha taught to work just in order to work. We don't ask for anything beyond that. If you do something just to get some return, it'll cause suffering. Try it out for yourself. You want to make your mind peaceful, so you sit down and try to make it peaceful. <coughs> You'll suffer. Try it. Our way is more refined. We do, and then we let go. Do, and then let go. Look at the Brahmin who makes a sacrifice. He has some desire in mind, so he makes a sacrifice. Those actions of his won't help him transcend suffering, 
because he's acting on desire. In the beginning, we practice with some desire in mind. We practice on and on, but we don't attain our desire. So we practice until we reach a point where we're practicing for no return. We're practicing in order to let go. This is something we must see for ourselves. It's very deep. Maybe we practice because we want to go to Nibbana. Right there, you won't get to Nibbana. It's natural to want peace, but it's not really correct. We must practice without wanting anything at all. If we don't want anything at all, what will we get? We don't get anything. Whatever you get is a cause of suffering, so we practice not getting anything. Just this is called making the mind empty. It's empty, but there is still doing. This emptiness is something people don't usually understand. Only those who reach it see the real value of it. It's not the emptiness of not having anything. It's emptiness within the things that are here. Like this flashlight. We should see this flashlight as empty. Because of the flashlight, there is emptiness. It's not the emptiness where we can't see anything. It's not like that. People who understand like that have got it all wrong. You must understand emptiness within the things that are here. Those who are still practicing because they have some gaining idea are like the Brahmin making a sacrifice just to fulfill some wish. Like the people who come to see me to be sprinkled with holy water. When I ask them, why do you want this holy water? They say, we want to live happily and comfortably and not get sick. There, they'll never transcend suffering that way. The worldly way is to do things for a reason, to get some return. But in Buddhism, we do things without the idea of gaining anything. The world has to understand things in terms of cause and effect, but the Buddha teaches us to go above and beyond cause and effect. His wisdom was to go above cause, beyond effect, to go above birth and beyond death, to go above happiness and beyond suffering. Think about it. There's nowhere to stay. We people live in a home. To leave home and go where there is no home, we don't know how to do that, because we've always lived with becoming, with clinging. If we can't cling, we don't know what to do. So, most people don't want to go to Nibbana. There's nothing there. Nothing at all. Look at the roof and floor here. The upper extreme is the roof. That's an abiding. The lower extreme is the floor. And that's another abiding. But in the empty space between the floor and the roof, there's nowhere to stand. One could stand on the roof or stand on the floor, but not on that empty space. Where there is no abiding, that's where there's emptiness. And Nibbana is this emptiness. People hear this and they back up a bit. They don't want to go. They're afraid they won't see their children or relatives. This is why when we bless the lay people we say, May you have a long life, beauty, happiness and strength. This makes them really happy. Sadhu, they all say. <laughs> they like these things. If you start talking about emptiness, they don't want it. They're attached to abiding. But have you ever seen a very old person with a beautiful complexion? Have you ever seen an old, an old person with a lot of strength or a lot of happiness? No. But we say, long life, beauty, happiness and strength. And they're all really pleased. Every single one says, Sadhu. This is like the Brahmin who makes oblations to achieve some wish. In our practice, we don't make oblations. We don't practice in order to get some return. We don't want anything. If we want something, then there is still something there. Just to make the mind peaceful and have done, just make the mind peaceful and have done with it. But if I talk like this, you may not be very comfortable because you want to be born again. All you lay practitioners should get close to the monks and see their practice. To be close to the monks means to be close to the Buddha, to be close to his Dhamma. The Buddha said, Ananda, practice a lot, develop your practice. Whoever sees the Dhamma sees me, and whoever sees me sees the Dhamma. Where is the Buddha? We may think the Buddha has been and gone, but the Buddha is the Dhamma, the truth. Some people like to say, oh, 
If I had been born in the time of the Buddha, I would have gone to Nibbana. Here, stupid people talk like this. The Buddha is still here. The Buddha is truth. Regardless of whoever is born or dies, the truth is still here. The truth never departs from the world. It's there all the time. Whether a Buddha is born or not, whether someone knows it or not, the truth is still there. So we should get close to the Buddha. We should come within and find the Dhamma. When we reach the Dhamma, we will reach the Buddha. Seeing the Dhamma, we will see the Buddha and all doubts will dissolve. To give a comparison, it's like Teacher Chu. At first he wasn't a teacher, he was just Mr. Chu. When he studied and passed the necessary grades, he became a teacher and became known as Teacher Chu. How did he become a teacher? <coughs> Through studying the required subjects, thus allowing Mr. Chu to become Teacher Chu. When Teacher Chu dies, the study to become a teacher still remains, and whoever studies it will become a teacher. That course of study to become a teacher doesn't disappear anywhere, just like the truth, the knowing of which enabled the Buddha to become the Buddha. So, the Buddha is still here. Whoever practices and sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. These days people have got it all wrong. They don't know where the Buddha is. They say, if I had been born in the time of the Buddha, I would have become a disciple of his and become enlightened. That's just foolishness. Don't go thinking at the end of the rains retreat you'll disrobe. Don't think like that. In an instant an evil thought can arise in the mind, you could kill somebody. In the same way, it only takes a split second for good to flash into the mind, and you're there already. And don't think that you have to ordain for a long time to be able to meditate. The right practice lies in the instant we make kamma. In a flash, an evil thought arises, and before you know it, you've committed some heavy kamma. In the same way, all the disciples of the Buddha practiced for a long time, but the time they attained enlightenment was merely one thought moment. So, don't be heedless, even in minor things. Try hard. Try to get close to the monks. Contemplate things, and then you'll know about monks. Well, that's enough, huh? Must be getting late now. Some people are getting sleepy. The Buddha said not to teach Dhamma to sleepy people. <laughs> Here you are. This is uh, talk number five, called Evening Sitting. And uh, this was originally published in... Uh, the book The Path to Peace and there's no um, uh, information about what year or what situation was that it was given in I would like to ask you about your practice you have all been practicing meditation here but are you sure about the practice yet ask yourselves are you confident about the practice yet these days there are all sorts of meditation teachers around both monks and lay teachers, and I'm afraid it'll cause you to be full of doubts and uncertainty about what you're doing. This is why I'm asking. As far as Buddhist practice is concerned, there is really nothing greater or higher than these teachings of the Buddha which you've been practicing with here. If you have a clear understanding of them, it'll give rise to an absolutely firm and unwavering peace in your heart and mind. Making the mind peaceful is known as practicing meditation, or practicing samadhi. The mind is something which is extremely changeable and unreliable. Observing from your practice so far, have you seen this yet? Some days you practice sitting meditation, and in no time at all, the mind is calm. Other days you sit, and whatever you do, there's no calm. The mind constantly struggles to get away, until eventually it does. Some days it goes well, some days it's awful. This is the way the mind displays these different conditions for you to see. You must understand that the eight <coughs> factors of the Noble Eightfold Path merge in sila, samadhi and banya. They don't come together anywhere else. This means that when you bring the factors of your practice together, there must be sila, there must be samadhi, and there must be panya present together in the mind. It means that in practicing meditation right here and now, you are creating the causes for the path to arise in a very direct way. In sitting meditation, you're taught to close your eyes so that you don't spend your time looking at different things. This is because the Buddha was teaching that you should know your own mind. 
observe the mind. If you close your eyes, your attention will naturally be turned inwards towards the mind, the source of many different kinds of knowledge. This is a way of training the mind to give rise to samadhi. Once sitting with the eyes closed, establish awareness with the breath. Make awareness of the breath more important than anything else. This means you bring awareness to follow the breath, and by keeping with it, you will know that place which is the focal point of sati, the focal point of the knowing and the focal point of the mind's awareness. <coughs> Whenever these factors of the path are working together, you will be able to watch and see your breath, feelings, mind and aramana as they are in the present moment. Ultimately, you will know that place which is both the focal point of samadhi and the unification point of the <coughs> path factors. Now, aramana means uh, simply a, a mental object. When developing samadhi, fix attention on the breath and imagine that you are sitting alone with absolutely no other people and nothing else around to bother you. Develop this perception in the mind, sustaining it until the mind completely lets go of the world outside and all that's left is simply the knowing of the breath entering and leaving. The mind must set aside the external world. Don't allow yourself to start thinking about this person who's sitting over here or that person who's sitting over there. Don't give space to any thoughts that will give rise to confusion or agitation in the mind. It's better to throw <coughs> them out and be done with them. There is no one else here. You're sitting all alone. Develop this perception until all the other memories, perceptions and thoughts concerning other people and things subside and you're no longer doubting or wondering about the other people or things around you. Then you can fix your attention solely on the in-breaths and out-breaths. Breathe normally. Allow the in-breaths and the out-breaths to, continu to continue naturally without forcing them to be longer or shorter, stronger or weaker than normal. Allow the breath to continue in a state of normality and balance and then sit and observe. Observe it, entering and leaving the body. Once the mind has let go of external mind objects, it means you will no longer feel disturbed by the sound of traffic or other noises. You won't feel irritated with anything outside, whether it's forms, sounds or whatever. They won't be a source of disturbance because the mind won't be paying attention to them. It will become centered upon the breath. If the mind is agitated by different things and you can't concentrate, try taking an extra deep breath until the lungs are completely full, and then release all the air until there's none left inside. Do this several times, then re-establish awareness and continue to develop concentration. Having re-established mindfulness, it's normal that for a period the mind will be calm and then, change, and then it'll change and become agitated again. When this happens, make the mind firm, take another deep breath, and subsequently expel all the air from your lungs. Fill the lungs to capacity again for a moment, and then re-establish mindfulness on the breathing. Fix sati on the in-breaths and the out-breaths, and continue to maintain awareness in this way. The practice tends to be this way, so it will have to take many sittings and much effort before you become proficient. Once you are, the mind will let go of the external world and remain undisturbed. Mind objects from the outside will be unable to penetrate inside and disturb the mind itself. Once they are unable to penetrate inside, you will see the mind. You will see the mind as one object of awareness, the breath as another, and mind objects as another. They will all be present within the field of awareness centered at the tip of your nose. Once sati is firmly established with the in-breaths and the out-breaths, you can continue to practice at your ease. As the mind becomes calm, the breath, which was originally coarse, becomes correspondingly lighter and more refined. The object of mind also becomes increasingly subtle and refined. The body feels lighter and the mind itself feels progressively lighter and unburdened. The mind lets go of external mind objects and you continue to observe internally. From here onwards your awareness will be turned away from the world outside and be directed inwards to focus on the mind. Once the mind has gathered together and become concentrated, maintain awareness at that point where the mind becomes focused. As you breathe, you will see the breath clearly as it enters and leaves. Sati will be sharp and awareness of mind objects and mental activity will be clearer. At that point, you will see the characteristics of sila, samadhi and panya 
and the way in which they merge together. This is known as the unification of the path factors. Once this unification occurs, your mind will be freed from all forms of agitation and confusion. It will become one-pointed, and this is what is known as samadhi. When you focus attention in just one place, in this case the breath, you gain a clarity and awareness because of the uninterrupted presence of sati. As you continue to see the breath clearly, sati will become stronger and the mind will become more sensitive in many different ways. You will see the mind in the center of that place, the breath, one pointed with awareness focused inwards, rather than turning towards the world outside. The external world gradually disappears from your awareness and the mind no longer goes to perform any work on the outside. It's as if you've come inside your house, where all your sense faculties have come together <coughs> to form one compact unit. You are at ease and the mind is free from all external objects. Awareness remains with the breath and over time it will penetrate deeper and deeper inside, becoming progressively more refined. Ultimately, awareness of the breath becomes so refined that the sensations of the breath seem to disappear. You could say either that awareness of the sensation of the breath has disappeared or that the breath itself has disappeared. Then there arises a new kind of awareness. Awareness that the breath has disappeared. In other words, awareness of the breath becomes so refined that it's difficult to define it. So, it might be that you're just sitting there and there's no breath. Really, the breath is still there, but it has become so refined that it seems to have disappeared. Why? Because the mind is at its most refined with a special kind of knowing. All that remains is the knowing. Even though the breath has vanished, the mind is still concentrated with the knowledge that the breath is not there. As you continue, what should you take up as the object of, of meditation? Take this very knowing as the meditation object. In other words, the knowledge that there is no breath, and sustain this. You could say that a specific kind of knowledge has been established in the mind. At this point, some people might have doubts arising, because it's here that nimitta, or mental signs, images or visions that can arise in meditation, these can appear. These can be of many kinds, including both forms and sounds. It's here that all sorts of unexpected things can arise in the course of the practice. If nimitta do arise, some people have them, some people don't, you must understand them in accordance with the truth. Don't doubt or allow yourself to become alarmed. At this stage, you should make the mind unshakable in its concentration and be especially mindful. Some people become startled when they notice that the breath has disappeared because they're used to having the breath there. When it appears that the breath has gone, you might panic or become afraid that you're going to die. Here you must establish the understanding that it's just the nature of the practice to progress in this way. What will you observe as the object of meditation now? Observe this feeling that there is no breath and sustain it as the object of awareness as you continue to meditate. The Buddha described this as the firmest, most unshakable form of samadhi. There is just one firm and unwavering, unwavering object of mind. When your practice of samadhi reaches this point, there will be many unusual and refined changes and transformations taking place within the mind, of which you can be aware. The sensation of the body will feel at its lightest, or might even disappear altogether. You might feel like you're floating in mid-air, or seem to be completely weightless. It might be like you're in the middle of space, and wherever you direct your sense faculties, they don't seem to register anything at all. Even though you know the body is still sitting there, you experience complete emptiness. This feeling of emptiness can be quite strange. As you continue to practice, understand that there's nothing to worry about. Establish this feeling of being relaxed and unworried, securely in the mind. Once the mind is concentrated and one-pointed, no mind object will be able to penetrate or disturb it, and you'll be able to sit like this for as long as you want. You'll be able to sustain concentration without any feelings of pain and discomfort. Having developed samadhi to this level, you'll be able to enter or leave it at will. When you do leave it, it's at your ease and convenience. You withdraw at your ease, rather than because you're feeling lazy or tired. You withdraw from samadhi because it's the appropriate time to withdraw, and you come out of it at your own will.
This is samadhi. You are relaxed and at your ease. You enter and leave it without any problems. The mind and heart are at ease. If you genuinely have samadhi like this, it means that sitting meditation and entering samadhi for just 30 minutes or an hour will enable you to remain cool and peaceful for many days afterwards. Experiencing the effects of samadhi like this for several days has a purifying effect on the mind. Whatever you experience will become an object for contemplation. This is where the practice really begins. It's the fruit which arises as samadhi matures. <coughs> samadhi performs the function of calming the mind. Samadhi performs one function, sila performs one function, and panya performs another function. These characteristics which you're focusing attention on and developing in the practice are linked, forming a circle. This is the way they manifest in the mind. Sila, samadhi and panya arise and mature from the same place. Once the mind is calm, it will become progressively more restrained and composed due to the presence of panya and the power of samadhi. As the mind becomes more composed and refined, this gives rise to an energy which acts to purify sila. Greater purity of sila facilitates the development of stronger and more refined samadhi, and this in turn supports the maturing of panya. They assist each other in this way. Each aspect of the practice acts as a supporting factor for the other ones. In the end, these terms become synonymous. As these three factors continue to mature together, they form one complete circle, ultimately giving rise to magga, the path. Magga is a synthesis of these three functions of the practice working smoothly and consistently together. As you practice, you have to preserve this energy. It is the energy which will give rise to vipassana or panya. Having reached this stage, where panya is already functioning in the mind, independent of whether the mind is peaceful or not, panya will provide a consistent and independent energy in the practice. You see that whenever the mind is not peaceful, you shouldn't attach. And even when it is peaceful, you shouldn't attach. Having let go of the burden of such concerns, the heart will accordingly feel much lighter. Whether you experience pleasant mind objects or unpleasant mind objects, you will remain at ease. The mind will remain peaceful in this way. Another important thing to see is that when you stop doing formal meditation practice, if there is no wisdom functioning in the mind, you will give up the practice altogether without any further contemplation, development of awareness or thought about the work which has still to be done. In fact, when you withdraw from samadhi, you know clearly in the mind that you have withdrawn. Having withdrawn, you should continue to conduct yourself in a normal manner. Maintain mindfulness and awareness at all times. It isn't that you only practice meditation in the sitting posture. Samadhi means the mind which is firm and unwavering. As you go about your daily life, make the mind firm and steady and maintain this sense of steadiness as the object of mind at all times. You must be practicing sati and sampajanya continuously. Sampajanya means self-awareness, self-recollection clear comprehension. After you get up from the formal sitting practice and go about your business, walking, riding in cars and so on, whenever your eyes see a form or your ears hear a sound, maintain awareness. As you experience mind objects which give rise to liking and disliking, try to consistently maintain awareness of the fact that such mental states are impermanent and uncertain. In this way the mind will remain calm and in a state of normality. As long as the mind is calm, use it to contemplate mind objects. Contemplate the whole of this form, the physical body. You can do this at any time and in any posture, whether it's doing formal meditation practice, relaxing at home, out at work, or in whatever situation you find yourself. Keep the meditation and the reflection going at all times. Just going for a walk and seeing dead leaves on the ground under a tree can provide an opportunity to contemplate impermanence. Both we and the leaves are the same. When we get old, we shrivel up and die. Other people are all the same. This is raising the mind to the level of vipassana, contemplating the truth of the way things are the whole time. Whether walking, standing, sitting or lying down, sati is sustained evenly and consistently. This is practicing meditation correctly. You have to follow the mind closely, checking it at all times.
practicing here and now at seven o'clock in the evening, we have sat and meditated together for an hour and now stopped. It might be that your mind has stopped practicing completely and hasn't continued with the reflection. That's the wrong way to do it. When we stop, all that should stop is the formal meeting and sitting meditation. You should continue practicing and developing awareness consistently without letting up. I've often taught that if you don't practice consistently, it's like drops of water. It's like drops of water because the practice is not a continuous, uninterrupted flow. Sati is not sustained evenly. The important point is that the mind does the practice and nothing else. The body doesn't do it. The mind does the work. The mind does the practice. If you understand this clearly, you will see that you don't necessarily have to do formal sitting meditation in order for the mind to know samadhi. The mind is the one who does the practice. You have to experience and understand this for yourself, in your own mind. Once you do see this for yourself, you will be developing awareness in the mind at all times and in all postures. If you are maintaining sati as an even and unbroken flow, it is as if the drops of water have joined to form a smooth and continuous flow of running water. Sati is present in the mind from moment to moment, and accordingly there will be awareness of mind objects at all times. If the mind is restrained and composed with uninterrupted sati, you will know mind objects at each time that, that wholesome and unwholesome mental states arise. You will know the mind that is calm and the mind that is confused and agitated. If you train the mind in this way, your meditation will mature quickly and successfully. Please don't misunderstand. These days, it's common for people to go on vipassana courses for three or seven days where they don't even have to speak or do anything but meditate. Maybe you've gone on a silent meditation retreat for a week or two, afterwards returning to your normal daily life. You might have left thinking that you've done vipassana, quote unquote, and because you feel that you know what it's all about, then you carry on going to parties, discos, indulging in different forms of sensual delight. When you do this, when you do it like this, what happens? There won't be any of the fruits of vipassana left by the end of it. If you go and do all sorts of unskillful things, which disturb and upset the mind, wasting your previous efforts, then next year you go back and do another retreat for seven days or a few weeks, then come out and carry on with the parties, discos and drinking. That isn't true practice. It isn't patibhada or the path to progress. You need to make an effort to renounce. You must contemplate until you see the harmful effects which come from such behaviour. See the harm in drinking and going out on the town. Reflect and see the harm inherent in all the different kinds of unskillful behaviour which you indulge in until it becomes fully apparent. This will provide the impetus for you to take a step back and change your ways. Then you would find some real peace. To experience peace of mind, you have to clearly see the disadvantages and danger in such forms of behaviour. This is practicing in the correct way. If you do a silent retreat for seven days, where you don't have to speak or get involved with anybody, and then go chatting, gossiping, overindulging for another seven months, how will you gain any real or lasting benefit from those seven days of practice? I would encourage all the lay people here who are practicing to develop awareness and wisdom to understand this point. Try to practice consistently. See the disadvantages of practicing insincerely and inconsistently and try to sustain a more dedicated and continuous effort in the practice. Just this much. It can then become a realistic possibility that you might put an end to the kilesa, the defilements, qualities that darken and defile the mind, such as greed, aversion and delusion. But that lifestyle of not speaking and not playing around for seven days, followed by six months of complete sensual indulgence without any mindfulness or restraint, will just lead to the squandering of any gains made from the meditation. There won't be anything left. It's like going to work for a day and earning twenty pounds, but then going out and spending thirty pounds on food and things in the same day. Would any money be saved? It would all be gone. It's just the same with the meditation. This is a form of reminder to you all, so I'll ask your, for your forgiveness. It's necessary to speak in this way so that those aspects of the practice which are at fault will become clear to you and accordingly you'll be able to give them up. 
You could say that the reason why you have come to practice is to learn how to avoid doing the wrong things in the future. What happens when you do the wrong things? Doing wrong things leads you to agitation and to suffering, when there's no goodness in the mind. It's not the way to peace of mind. This is the way it is. If you practice on a retreat, not talking for seven days, and then go indulging for a few months, no matter how strictly you practice for those seven days, you won't derive any lasting value from that practice. Practicing that way, you don't really get anywhere. Many places where meditation is taught don't really get to grips with or get beyond this problem. Really, you have to conduct your daily life in a consistently calm and restrained way. In meditation, you have to be constantly turning your attention to the practice. It's like planting a tree. If you plant a tree in one place, and after three days pull it up and plant it in a different spot, then after a further three days pull it up again and plant it in yet another place, it'll just die without producing anything. Practicing meditation like this won't bear any fruit either. This is something you have to understand for yourselves. Contemplate it. Try it out for yourselves when you go home. Get a sapling and plant it in one spot, and every few days go and pull it up and plant it in a different place. It will just die without ever bearing any fruit. It's the same doing a meditation retreat for seven days, followed by seven months of unrestrained behavior, allowing the mind to become soiled, and then going back to do another retreat for a short period, practicing strictly without talking and subsequently coming out and being unrestrained again. As with the tree, the meditation just dies. None of the wholesome fruits are retained. The tree doesn't grow, the meditation doesn't grow. I say, practicing this way doesn't bear much fruit. Actually, I'm not fond of giving talks like this. It's because I feel sorry for you that I have to speak critically. When you're doing the wrong things, it's my duty to tell you. But I'm speaking out of compassion for you. Some people might feel really uneasy and think that I'm just scolding them. Really, I'm not just scolding you for its own sake. I'm helping to point out where you're going wrong, so that you know. Some people might think Long Po is just telling us off, but it's not like that. It's only once in a long while that I'm able to come and give a talk. If I were to give talks like this every day, you would really get upset. But the truth is, it's not you who gets upset. It's only the kilesa, your defilements, that are upset. I will say just this much for now. Here you are.